Uh, my name is Claire Ryan. I'm the team leader of the Take Two Clinical Practice Development team, and I'll be, I guess, I'll be your host for today. Um, we're really excited to have this opportunity to share, I guess, what we've learned in Take Two about working with children who've experienced trauma, and to share that knowledge with all of you people who have joined um, today. So. Let me just start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that we're on. So Berry Street acknowledges the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land, skies and waterways across Australia. Today, we wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. I'm here on Wurundjeri country. Um, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be with us today and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, families, friends and communities with whom we work. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little bit of housekeeping for the session. Um, you should have received a notification that the session's being recorded. You're welcome to leave your camera on or turn your camera off. That's entirely up to you. You can delete your name from the screen if you'd like to remain anonymous. Um, we really welcome people to use the chat thread. Um, so if you haven't opened up the chat thread and you'd like to, please do that. The chat thread won't be included in the recording. Um, the structure of the session is that we'll go until 11.30. We'll, we've sort of got two presentations. So the first presentation will go to just before 10.30 and then we'll have a quick break, just a five minute break. And then we'll have the second presentation. At the end of each of those presentations, we'll allow five or 10 minutes to respond to questions and comments. Um, we've had some people submit questions prior to the session and I imagine there'll be um, a few people making comments or asking questions in the chat thread. So my colleagues, Jessamy House and Jen Willis will be following the chat thread and I'll also be following the chat thread and we will, we will endeavor to note questions as they arise and note themes and try to respond to those at the end of each session. Um, I am aware that there's an awful lot of people who have registered to join us today. So we may not be able to get to every question, but we will do our best. Um, What's next? Uh, in terms of the case materials that are being presented today, just to flag with you that um, uh, any, any sort of, there are no identifying factors in the cases today, although the, the second presentation involves a client where we do actually have family permission to talk about the case, um, but it has been partially identified to respect our client's privacy. Uh, any images that we use in our presentation presentations today are just stock images. Um, I reckon that's about it. Oh, in terms of how you want to view this, you can select how you view it. There's a, a view options on your Zoom screen. You can sort of select whether you just see the speaker or whether you see the gallery view, etc. Um, and I guess I should, um, in, in the spirit of being trauma informed, I would, would like to just start with giving a bit of a, um, I guess a safety warning that we are talking about children who have experienced trauma today. So I would just like to flag with people that whenever we talk about the things that can happen to children and happen to families, that that can trigger feelings, memories and thoughts in all of us. Um, so do what you need to do to keep yourself, um, keep yourself safe today and to focus yourselves. And, you know, if you need to turn your camera off and take a little break from the screen, then please do so. All right. Um, let's get started. So the first presentation we have today is a presentation that is drawn from our Take Two practice guide that we actually released last year, um, which is a practice guide around engaging with children who have experienced trauma. And our presentation is going to be from Holly Moss, who is our Take Two Assistant Director, and Holly's a psychologist. And alongside her is Jessamy House, who is a social worker, and Jessamy works with me in the Take Two Clinical Practice Development team. And Jessamy was the author of that practice guide on engaging with children who have experienced trauma. So welcome, Holly and Jessamy. Oh, thank you, Claire. Thank you for the introduction, Claire. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I am meeting with you all from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and to pay my respects to elders past and present. So Berry Street is Victoria's largest independent not-for-profit child and family services organisation. 
And we believe that children, young people and families should be safe, thriving and hopeful. Berry Street is the lead agency in the Take Two partnership and they provide expertise in child and family welfare. We also have La Trobe University supporting our research and our evaluation expertise, the University of Melbourne Centre for Training and Research in Developmental Health, also known as Mindful, and they support our mental health and practice development expertise. And we also have the Victorian Aboriginal Childcare Agency, also known as VACA, who support our Aboriginal team to provide cultural expertise. Take Two began as an intensive therapeutic service for children in out of home care back in 2004. And initially we were funded solely by the Victorian state government. Since then, we have expanded quite a lot um, to deliver developmental trauma support services to children victim survivors of family violence, to residential care units run by both Berry Street and other community service organisations to families being reunited after the removal of children by child protection and to Aboriginal community controlled organisations. We also provide professional development sessions and tailored training and consultancy to other organisations around the country who are working with children who have experienced trauma. The Take Two clinical model is an intensive and tailored outreach clinical service and we undertake multidisciplinary and systemic assessments from a social determinants of health model in order to work with all of the factors that are impacting on a child's development, mental health, and most importantly, their lived experience. We are a flagship site for Dr. Bruce Perry's Neurosequential Model of Therapeutics, also known as NMT, and we're accredited by the Australian Council of Healthcare Standards. So at Take Two, um, We've decided to deliver a range of clinical conversations and practice guides to share our expertise in understanding the developmental challenges and the mental health of children who've experienced trauma. While we're going to be talking more specifically about the work of Take Two in these clinical conversations, the practice guides that we're developing will contain the underpinning therapeutic principles that inform our work and that you can use and implement in your own work. Today's content is based upon our first free practice guide, which is engaging children living in out-of-home care. But the content is relevant to all professionals and services um, who are working with children in out-of-home care, as well as those working with children who have experienced trauma. The other two clinical conversations and accompanying practice guides for 2022 will explore um, trauma-informed assessment or basically understanding the child and how we can understand the child who's experienced trauma. And the last one will be therapeutic approaches and considerations when working with children who have experienced trauma. In addition to these clinical conversations and the practice guides, we also offer a diverse range of training, clinical and consultation services. And you can check out the details of these on our website. We've also got a free e-newsletter called Relate which I encourage you to subscribe to if you haven't already. I'm now gonna hand over to Jessamy to set the scene of some of the complexities that you might experience when trying to engage with children who have experienced trauma. Over to you, Jessamy. Wonderful, thank you, Holly. Um, so to start today's session, I'm going to invite you all to participate in an activity that you can do privately as you listen to me talk. So I'm about to share with you two stock images of children who are expressing particular emotions and responses to their environments and the people around them. For each image, I want you to have a think about how you might label their behaviour and their possible emotions. And also have a think about how others around the child, such as, sorry, such as teachers, parents, and people in the community might label their behaviour. So most of the children referred to take two come to the attention of adults because of their behaviour. What's less visible to the people around them is the overwhelming feelings of distress and fear that they're usually experiencing. This is usually invisible and it's not commonly understood by children themselves. And we often hear phrases used to explain the behaviours that we're seeing, terms like complex and challenging behaviours behaviours of concern and problematic behaviours. 
if we have a look at picture one here, this is representing an eight-year-old girl who struggles to make friends and get along with her peers. She's quick to fly off the handle and hard to calm down. Teachers and carers are concerned that she often absconds or runs away from school and her placement. She lives in out-of-home care. These behaviours are very difficult to manage and put her at risk as she doesn't seem to know where she's going or what she's doing. Thank you. So addressing these behaviours has become the primary focus of the people around her. Different responses and consequences have been tried without any success. And these include things like talking with her, reasoning with her, talking about the risk that she's putting herself at, excluding her from excursions in case she runs away, and removing privileges such as access to her iPad. Her take two clinician makes an effort to look behind these behaviours to try and make sense of what's happening for her. It seems that groups of children making noise cause her to be overwhelmed by a wave of distress and fear that she can't cope with. Her impulse is to flee. It's a self-protective response. This little girl was raised in a household where family violence occurred. She doesn't purposefully run away, but she flees the noise and activity that cause her to feel ex uh, experience feelings of terror. And due to the neglect that occurred for her when she was a baby, her language and social development is more like that, than, more like that of a three-year-old. She doesn't have the ability to use words to sort things out. Unfortunately, talking is how the well-meaning adults around her have tried to help her. So picture two is an adolescent boy who has been excluded from his school for his openly angry, defiant and sometimes violent behaviour. This leads to adults being fearful of him. And he reads these fearful responses as being rejection. And he is alternatively angry and hopeless in his mood. His early life history is unclear, but it's suspected that he and his siblings were emotionally and physically abused. Medical investigations have shown poorly healed bones, including an injury to his head. He's being assessed for ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and is known to experience low moods and anxiety. Sometimes this includes burning himself. He describes feeling out of control and doesn't understand why he acts the way that he does. His clinician performs a classroom observation and notices the more upset he becomes, the less he understands what's going on around him. This prompts his clinician to consult with other specialists, including a neuropsychologist. The clinician and his school will work together on a plan once the outcome of the cognitive assessment is known. So these are all examples of the types of issues that are presented to clinicians at Take Two. These are presented as areas of concern and they might also present with other complex health issues or diagnoses and disabilities, meaning that this is complex work. The way that well-meaning adults interpret this behaviour can sometimes miss what's really going on. Today, we're going to be emphasising that the primary goal of engagement is to determine what creates safety for a child. This need for safety, it never goes away. It begins in our first interactions with them and it's held in mind throughout our relationship with them. And what we think should be safe for them might not actually be experienced as safe by them. So what do we mean when we use this word engagement? Without the development of a relationship based in trust that the child enjoys and finds fun and rewarding, it's really difficult to, to maintain relationships with them. Little disagreements and things that go wrong can be seen as proof that we can't be trusted and they may elicit feelings of abandonment in the child. We may feel rejected by their behaviour ourselves and we might respond to that but we need to see that their behaviour is a symptom of the abuse and neglect that they've suffered. And just because the child should be safe with us doesn't mean they're going to feel that safety. As we move through today's discussion, we'll talk about the ways that we can identify behaviour that might indicate that children are feeling unsafe. Things like wariness, fear, withdrawal, or even violence, and how we might be able to respond. So intentional engagement, what do we mean by this? We mean that we can't just turn up and adopt a friendly stance with these kids and expect them to trust us. 
We need to find out what works for them. We need to know what scares them. We need to know if a support person needs to be there when we see them. Is there a place that they feel safe and comfortable in? So we need to plan. It's helpful to anticipate what might cause stress for them so that we can reduce exposure to this, but we can also have some ways of helping them out if we need to. And if we were to look into their world and try and understand their experiences, what might we see? It's common for these children to have experienced abuse and neglect by loved ones who were supposed to care. And you are being presented as someone who is supposed to care. So what does this association mean for the child? How will they make sense of our well-intentioned interactions? So most of the children we see don't just have a traumatic experience, they have chronic repeated experiences and layers of adversity from babyhood onwards. They might also experience racism and they might experience dislocation from culture and identity. We need to think about all of this. What do their experiences mean? And, and what, what do they mean for how they'll engage with us? And what's it gonna mean over time as they become more familiar with us? What could start playing out in our relationship with them? And how am I going to be able to respond to that? So every one of us has some type of set of assumptions about the world. For example, one set of positive assumptions might be, when I need help, my family provides me with help. I can turn to them when I need support. They understand me. Therefore, I am understandable. I have power over what happens to me. I can make choices myself and I can be in control of my world. And this compared to a child who has experienced trauma, whose set of assumptions could be more like, when I need help, no one will know and no one will listen. I have to rely on myself for safety. I am not understood, therefore I cannot be understood. More often than not, I am alone, even when others are around. The only power I have is the power that I fight for and the best that I can do is survive. So this experience of the world and the people in it being unsafe is fundamental to how a child with trauma experiences might behave. It needs to be central to how we plan our engagement with them, where we meet them, who's there, what we talk about and how we talk about it. We also need to be noticing any shifts in the child's mood or behaviour and be curious about what is behind this. We want to avoid behaving in a way that reinforces the belief that they're in danger. So one of the ways that we can go about this work is being mindful of an approach called the sequence of engagement. This was developed by Dr. Bruce Perry, who Holly referred to earlier, who's a, a child psychiatrist in the US. So the central premise of this is that children with trauma experiences are intently tuned into the possibility of danger, resulting in them experiencing states of fear and hypervigilance, sometimes withdrawal, um, violence, and maybe even aggression. In short, this is what we think about as the flight, fight, freeze, flock responses. And these emotional states, when a child is in them, it shuts down the child's ability to think and to reason, to listen to what you're saying and to be able to understand you. So we need to attend to these self-protective impulses before we can really start working with them. So this upside down triangle here illustrates Dr. Perry's sequence of engagement. Each slice of the triangle represents a part of the child's brain. The yellow area at the bottom here represents the brainstem where our survival related functions that I was just talking about are controlled. So these are automatic responses, they're outside of a child's conscious control. These self-protective responses can be triggered by sensory input, such as a certain sound, a smell or a facial expression that's associated with a past trauma. So the most effective ways to soothe these responses and reduce the level of stress for the child is by providing regulating activities. These are sensory based activities, usually involving play and movement. And we'll talk more about these in detail throughout the session. 
So co-regulation through the presence of a predictable and trusted adult is also important for these children. They generally can't soothe themselves. They need the help of someone there that they can rely upon. And our practice examples in the second half of today's clinical conversation will really flesh these out for you. The aqua section here represents the midbrain areas. And these are the parts of the brain associated with emotions, language, and attachment or relationships. When the yellow part of the brainstem there is regulated, we can begin to access the midbrain. And this is where we can start to connect and talk together and generally engage in social interactions. This then opens the gateway to the blue parts of the brain, the reason parts here, which are the cortical parts of the brain. And this is involved in concrete and abstract thinking, self-control, decision-making, and importantly for children, understanding consequences. So this is a bottom-up model. We regulate from the bottom and through regulating up from the bottom through the brainstem, the midbrain, and then the reason part of the brain, we can bring a child into the present moment and we can start to connect with them and reason with them. It's very useful for our work with children with trauma experiences because they're often activated in that yellow zone there. And new situations, new people and demands, such as having a new teacher, having a new worker, going to a new place, that can really increase their experiences of stress. So to engage with these children, to communicate effectively, we first have to regulate through supportive sensory experiences as well as co-regulation. Now, we're called Take Two because we know that it takes more than one person on their own to help children who have experienced trauma to feel safe and to hopefully start to heal and grow. We need to connect with the family and the carers and the teachers and the school staff, doctors and therapists and whoever is around, around the child. By working together and by developing a shared understanding, we're more likely to be able to provide the many positive experiences that can counteract the bad. So this image on the screen is a gathering circle and it has been developed by our Aboriginal team in Take Two to help our clinicians understand both the human and non-human entities that are important to Aboriginal children and that we need to be able to connect with and bring into our work with them to create safety, but also create a strong sense of identity and belonging. So the circular parts of the image here represent relationships and roles and people that are relevant across all cultural backgrounds. So here we see things like family, kin, extended family, school, community organisations. But the outer images of this image, they speak to more than non-human entities that are culturally specific and very important for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in terms of their personal and family history, their identity and their belief system. So here we see things like ancestors, mob, country and flora and fauna. And in our work, we wanna find ways to bring these entities in closer to the child, to help them feel strong and to help them feel connected to their identity and community. And this might involve doing things like having appointments at the local Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal community controlled organization, finding out who's important in their community and going on country with them, providing ways to integrate totems and culturally based storytelling into our work with them. And we're provided advice uh, by these approaches uh, by the Aboriginal team. So these non-human entities here are of particular importance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, but they can be used to symbolise culturally important concepts across different cultures. So we might add like a place or country of birth, uh, a country of family origin, a religion, events of cultural or ritual significance, art or music, etc. And at that point, I will hand back over to you, Holly. Right, thank you, Jessamy. 
Um, so at this point, people in the audience might be feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the task of trying to engage with children who have experienced trauma. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some of the principles of practice with these children that are relevant across all professional disciplines. Um, so we've got a people here today from a range of workplaces. Um, we've got people from child and adolescent mental health, the education system, out of home care and child protection, just to name a few. And there are some key messages that are relevant across all of these roles in regards to engaging with children who've experienced trauma. And the first two principles that I'm going to talk about relate to the context in which the child lives at the current point in time. So the first principle is around understanding developmental age. And because of the neglect, abuse and the other traumatic experiences that they've had, many children have actually missed out on the caregiving and the experiences that would have supported positive normative development. So these kids might actually be developmentally much younger than they appear. So we need to make sure that we're pitching our interventions at the child's developmental age and not their chronological age. And this might mean we need to have a variety of engagement activities available across age ranges for the child to opt into. So we're giving the child a choice about what they actually do. It's also really important that we consider the level of language development and that we're using appropriate words that make sense to the child. Children with a history of trauma, as Jessamy mentioned earlier, also have a lot of attentional difficulties due to hypervigilance. So you might need to break things down into smaller chunks or use visual images. Some of the kids that we work with might not have had many opportunities to experience um, play or particular interactive play with other people. So they might actually need to watch you doing an activity before they're gonna feel safe to join in with you. So it's really important that we meet the child where they are at and not where we expect they should be in terms of their development. The second key principle is around safety and the sense of safety. So we know for children that have experienced trauma, healing from these past hurts is reliant on the child being in a safe environment where they feel a sense of belonging, a sense of other people being like them and of having a place in the world. So we need to remember that children benefit from and are actually entitled to engagement approaches that are culturally familiar and safe and meet the child's unique needs. So this means we must learn about and pay respects to their cultural identity, as Jessamy mentioned earlier, the child's lived experience and its significance to the way we engage and connect with the child. So a really important concept to think of is um, differentiating between the child being safe and the child actually feeling safe. And just because we set up an environment and an approach that we think is safe for the child doesn't necessarily mean that that child will experience that as safe. It's really important that we be curious about the role of culture in the child's life. And this is particularly for children from First Nations communities. And if a child is from a different culture to yours um, and you're not familiar with that, it's really important to consult with a cultural advisor or an elder in the community. We really need to be open to adapting our approaches to prioritise cultural safety, as this is really often overlooked in clinical settings. We need to make sure that we're identifying a place to meet with the child that is appropriate, is safe, and is also experienced as safe for the child. It's also good to provide opportunities for mastery experiences where the child feels in control and experiences feeling competent and capable, as that will make them feel safer with you. And I think it's important here that we also discuss um, intersectionality. So we need to think about the questions of engagement in the context of the individual child. And that includes their past and their current lived experiences, their current supports and relational health, but also the socio-political and cultural context in which they're living. Um, I think most people will probably be familiar with the term intersectionality. And that's where we consider the crossover and the cumulative effect of various diversity factors that impact on a person's lived experience. And this includes their gender and sexuality, race and culture, and their physical and neurological capacities. So a consideration of all these factors will help you in determining what is the most appropriate and therapeutic response to a child at a given point in time. 
So as well as these two broad sort of contextual factors of developmental age and safety, we also need to consider the child's way of being in the world. So how they experience the world and how they manage their experiences, especially the challenging and difficult ones. And an important part of this task is for us to recognise um, what self-soothing behaviours look like for the child. Because children will always try and make themselves feel better using learned self-soothing behaviours. Um, and this is something that we all do. So for children who've experienced trauma, they might seek to avoid people and experiences that are distressing by acting out or running away or withdrawing into themselves. And mistreated children experience danger and distress as sensations within their bodies that they might not understand or be able to articulate and describe. So they're really primed to sense danger even when it no longer exists because they've learnt from a young age that the world is not a safe place. And they'll act out emotionally as well as physically as a protective mechanism. These children's brains are responding to perceived danger instinctively without conscious thinking. So if we go back to the upside down triangle, they're really acting from the yellow bottom part of the brain. So we can't expect to rely on just talking to soothe children who are in a fearful state. We need to think about how we can help them to control or regulate their body and the threat activated responses that they're having. Now, many children with this type of stress response will develop ways of soothing themselves that are problematic to other people. So they might use risky behaviours such as aggression, violence, substance use, or developmentally inappropriate sexual activity. Other children might turn their painful feelings inwards using self-harm, social withdrawal, disconnection, or dissociation as ways of coping. Now these behaviours can create significant challenges for the child and for those around them, including carers, teachers, support workers, and even peers and friends. They can test relationships and make things like managing a group or a classroom extremely difficult. So our task is to understand the reason for the behaviour or what we might call the, the um, function of the behaviour and what is it achieving for the child's emotional regulation. We're not excusing the behaviour, rather we're being more thoughtful and informed about the way to engage and work with the child when they're demonstrating that behaviour. So it's important to remember that we always accept the child and regard them positively even while we might be feeling very concerned about the behaviours that they're using. So these are some examples of self-soothing behaviours that we work with in Take Two. Um, and I think they should come up on the screen one at a time. So he's constantly fiddling and not paying attention. The other day I got cross at her about something and it was like, she just froze me out. She went completely blank. He loves computer games, spends hours and hours and gets really angry when I tell him enough is enough. He picks at his skin and won't stop no matter what I do or say. So these are pretty common presentations that we see with children that we work with at Take Two. And I'm wondering if any of these observations are familiar to people here today, um, or if you can think of any other examples um, and feel free to pop those in the chat. So some of these behaviors involve a child acting out against the world or against others as a way of protecting themselves from what they experience as danger. So it's really important that we remember that this is not often a conscious process of thinking, but rather that something that happens that triggers a fear response for the child. Um, and it could be something as simple as a noise, a facial expression on an adult, or something else around them, even a smell in the environment, that acts as a reminder of an earlier trauma and triggers a child. Some of these are examples of children who withdraw into themselves or away from the world, in order to avoid things that cause distress and fear. So when children feel threatened, they basically learn adaptive behaviours to cope and to keep safe, even if those behaviours might not look particularly good to us. So it's helpful to think about the challenging behaviours that, that we're seeing, um, including things like, you know, the child rejecting you, being angry at you, withdrawing from you, or even using violence. We need to remember that these are ways that the children have learned to protect themselves from perceived danger. 
And when we can look at it from this perspective, this also helps us to manage our own reactions to the behaviour and to be calmer and more empathic in our approach with the child, which will actually facilitate engagement as opposed to punitive and invalidating responses, which will likely just increase the child's distress. So how can we respond to what is going on behind these safety seeking behaviours? Um, so as Jessamy mentioned earlier, often these children will be labelled as naughty, disruptive, non-compliant, oppositional, um, and then behavioural management plans are enacted, which often involve reward and punishment and incentives. But if we understand these behaviours as fear-based and often instinctive reactions, it actually means that the child needs to be supported to feel safe, and that means that our responses must adapt to that. So carefully thought through relevant and timely consequences can work very effectively with children developing um, or who've developed without traumatic backgrounds. And you can think about things like star charts and um, pocket money and things like that. But these kind of approaches can have unintended consequences for children who've experienced trauma. And this is because these responses do not calm the stress response system for these children and the associated brain-based reactions that they're having. So rather than facilitating relational connection and trust, they can actually unintentionally enhance feelings of shame and lack of safety and trust for the child. So the best consequence for a child with a trauma experience can actually be to reconnect with the adult or the children involved and to do something to make amends for what's happened. So providing relational safety is essential for engagement and we can't engage with traumatized children without them feeling relationally safe with us. It's also important to remember that the responsibility for engagement sits with us, the professionals, and it's up to us to work out how we can be safe for the child. So a great way to start this process is to build developmentally matched, sensory-based and rewarding activities into the time that you spend with the child. And by providing opportunities to engage in regular, predictable and time-limited physical experiences that are activating the child's senses in a rewarding manner, you can help to manage the stress that leads to difficult behaviours. So we can't expect traumatised children to sit in a chair in an office and just engage with us. It's just not safe for them to do that, um, no matter how much they might want to try and comply with these expectations. A great strategy is something like walking and talking, which can be done in most settings. And the talking initially should focus on observations of the environment or light topics that don't activate the child's stress system until they feel that you're a safe and trusted adult who can help them to manage their difficult feelings in a supportive way. As we discussed earlier, um, when it's possible, try and ensure that the environment where you're meeting the child contains resources and activities that match their stage of development and their interests. So things such as toys, art materials and fidget tools are really good. And consider using physical activities like drawing or playing with a ball as part of your engagement. These sorts of experiences will provide important sensory input that will help to regulate the child's stress response when meeting with you. And importantly, they might also help you to regulate yourself, which is a critical element of any effective engagement strategy when working with traumatised children. We really need to demonstrate trustworthiness for these children. Um, so you need to expect that you will need to be gently persistent to come back and try again and again and again after rejection from them to be really transparent, open and honest about what you can and can't do. And also to think about engaging with a child's parents and caregivers to talk to them about your role and to get their perspective on what is going on for their child and including them as a support for the child as needed. So it's really important to, um, when trying to engage with a child who has experienced trauma, to be mindful of your own responses and reactions to their behaviours, as this can be really stressful work. Um, and Nadine will talk a little bit about this in the case study that she's presenting afterwards. So check in on your own responses regularly and do activities um, to self-regulate yourself as needed when with a child. It's also good to try and learn the early signs of stress and distress that the child shows. And parents and caregivers um, and even classroom teachers might be able to help you with this. 
You can then intervene early to redirect the child to a more regulating activity. And this will show the child that you're safe to be around and that they won't associate you with danger and distress. So the research on the neurobiology of childhood trauma shows that regular and brief positive interactions are the most effective as they're of a tolerable duration for the child. The repetition strengthens neural pathways around positive experiences and the predictability provides psychological safety to the child. So I'm now gonna hand back over to Jessamy, who's going to share some practical examples of effective and trauma-informed engagement techniques that we use here at Take Two um, and that you can actually use in your interactions with children who've experienced trauma as well. So over to you, Jessamy. Wonderful, thank you, Holly. So I've, I've taken some pictures here of, of things around um, the Take Two office and, and the rooms in which um, children are seen, as well as taking some photos just from the internet to demonstrate different environments. Um, so what you see first here is a picture of a child hiding behind a cushion. And this is meant to represent that children can benefit from having access to materials that, that they can literally hide behind when they're, when they're spending time with you, or that they can maybe put on their bodies um, to help them feel comforted. In this example, we have a pillow, but we like to provide things like blankets that children can get underneath, um, you know, cushions on couches that they can put on their laps. And sometimes kids even just like to sit out of view behind a piece of furniture while we're meeting with their carer or even while we're talking to them because looking at us is too overwhelming but hearing a voice might be tolerable to them. Um, in some situations, clinicians will uh, engage in building a cubby or a blanket fort with children they're working with and that the child can opt in and out of this fort depending on whether they want to come out and be in the presence of the adults in the room or whether they just want to stay in there and observe what, what, what's happening. Um, and clearly this is a very effective approach for children that are experiencing hypervigilance. So this is the type of approach that can be adopted across a number of different Different settings. I've certainly seen some beautiful examples in classrooms of um, teachers who set up little areas where children can go with soft furnishings and spend some time kind of, you know, coming down from a place of stress. Um, but I guess sometimes the unnoticed benefit of that is that the child's able to remove themselves from a busy environment and experience, you know, a setting that's a bit calmer and a bit safer for them. And we can also just supply, you know, soft furnishings and materials in offices and places that we meet with children in, um, and even taking it outdoors sometimes and having children create spaces outside that they can, they can play in and they can sort of create some distance from the adults um, around them. And then secondly here, we have some beautiful um, examples of materials that have been put together by our Aboriginal team to support clinicians in their work. Um, and we see here some dolls, we see uh, 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 creatures that might represent um, animals or totems. Um, there is a knitted ball there in the colour of the Aboriginal flag that can be used to throw around without actually hurting anyone can be squeezed and played with. Um, and the dolls that you see here can be used by a child to express themselves, to explain how the doll's feeling and show how the doll's playing as a way of expressing their own feelings and thoughts and emotions in a way that's less threatening. Um, and so these are also materials that uh, anyone can have available who's spending time with children, where they can choose the things that they feel attracted to and that would work for them and play with them. Um, and they might just fiddle with them and enjoy that experience, have a positive experience from that and feel a little bit more calm and a little bit more safe. Or they may actually use the toys to express what they're thinking and, and how they're feeling. Now, these materials are obviously pretty specialist and not everyone here in the virtual room is going to have access to them. So our Aboriginal team has provided a list of websites that people can visit where you can download um, free resources um, to use with children. 
but we would absolutely encourage you to find out what the child's interests are, you know, what are the items that are culturally relevant to them before downloading and presenting them to the child. Um, and it includes things like, you know, colouring in sheets um, of, of different animals, you know, different activities that you might like to do, like jumping like a kangaroo or walking like an emu, things that are quite soothing in a sensory based manner. So we're going to post those in the chat and I understand that we'll also be providing them to people afterwards in a communication. Um, and so this is just an example of a child using craft material. Um, craft material is, is wonderful to have on hand. It gives children a chance just to interact with the materials in a way that's very satisfying in terms of the sensory input. You know, things like scrunching paper or squeezing out paint, squishing and molding, all those types of things can be very rewarding and also gives them another way of communicating with you. Um, we really love using Play-Doh and Kinetic Sand um, because it's just really really lovely to have those in your hands as you're talking but they can also be used to make things and to have a part of your conversation. Um, some children really benefit from sort of bigger movements so moving their body in a big way engaging their gross motor skills and what you see here is a rocking chair um, that we have in one of our rooms at take two we also have things like balance balls and yoga balls that children can bounce around on or use in a way that they enjoy there's a basketball ring and also some young people walking in a park um, holly mentioned earlier that just by having a walk and talk um, can be a much safer way to engage a child in a way that's regulating, but also where they don't have to look at you, they're kind of next to you and that feels safer. So we really encourage you to think about getting outside if that's something that you can do, that there's you know things going on um, in the natural environment that can be focused on as a way of bringing the child into the present moment. And by you know playing or engaging in some sort of bigger movements, um, the child is more likely to, kind of come into a more regulated state, although that's something they tend to come in and out of, they won't stay in it, but we know that we can provide windows of regulation um, where they're more likely to be able to engage with us. Now, the last image here is of a fluffy little girl called Cookie. And the reason we've included her is because during the long, hard lockdowns in Melbourne, our clinical staff have developed a whole suite of skills around using their home environments to engage with the child, um, to create play opportunities through the camera, um, and to create a sense of familiarity between sessions where Cookie might make an appearance most sessions and create that kind of theme of continuity between meetings between um, a clinician and a child. So this, this cat cookie is the pet of our clinician who will be presenting next, Nadine, and she's going to talk with us about how Cookie featured in her work with a young girl called Leah. But that brings us to the end of this, of this presentation. Thank you, Jessamy, and thank you, Holly. Um, we've got about, you know, five to ten maximum minutes to, um, to talk or sort of respond to some of the questions that have come up. Um, we had... We did have a couple of people submit questions prior to this session, um, and one of the questions, uh, oh, look, it was it was quite a complex question, I guess, um, and it came from Emma, um, and the question was around how how to sort of respond to if you're working therapeutically with a child and they, uh, you know, your your assessment, you you believe that the child has probably experienced childhood trauma but the child hasn't disclosed it or is, is possibly even actively denying that anything bad has happened to them um, and your sort of therapeutic work is not really being very effective because you think that you know it's not really addressing the underlying cause which is the childhood trauma how do you how do you manage that or how do you know do you have a conversation or how do you safely have a conversation with the child that that hopefully will get them to talk about the trauma 
Okay, so I'll, I'll respond to that one, Claire. So this is a really interesting and relevant question. So thank you for submitting it, Emma. Um, it, it's highly relevant because many of the children we work with at Take Two are unable to recall the traumatic events that have occurred um, because these incidents might have happened at an age uh, in which they were too early to, to remember, and the children might not have developed language skills um, at that point in time as well to express themselves. Um, and we know that for many of these children, they don't, they don't recall an actual memory, but they experience the impacts of trauma through sensations in their bodies that are triggered by things that happen in the environment around them. So they might experience tension and fear and anxiety or a desire to run away rather than actually, you know, recalling a memory of what happened to them, of what they're being reminded of. And this is something that's noted by child psychiatrist uh, Bessel van der Kolk is that trauma lives in the body. It's, it's not always something that lives in the head, it's something that lives in the body and, you know, reminders of the trauma will, will, will um, trigger sensations in, in the body. And so, you know, for, for this reason and others, we don't require a disclosure by a child to work with them at take two. But what we, what we will do is that we'll work with the child and their family and carer to understand what the problem is from their perspective. And, and what goal would they like to be working on with us? And quite often these goals are things like, I don't want to be so worried anymore. I want to sleep better. I don't want to fight with my friends. I don't want to fight in my family anymore. Um, very rarely is the goal to resolve traumatic experiences or memories. It, it's usually more sort of tangible goals for the child. And so we will develop a intervention plan based on what the goals of the child and the family are. And we'll review that intervention plan as it's implemented, just to monitor its success and to see how it's being received by the child and the family. Um, and the clinician will also have an opportunity to collect history from the various people that we work with, including the child and the family, but also potentially child protection files um, and other professionals that might hold some of that history for the family so that we do have a broader context of what the trauma might have looked like and when it might have occurred. <clears throat> and that also helps us plan our interventions. Thank you, Jessamy. Um, look, there's, we have had a couple of other questions, but the, the one I'm probably going to highlight um, came from Cherie in the chat thread. And um, it was when, uh, I can't remember whether it was you, Jessamy, or you, Holly, but you talked about brief, pleasurable interactions. Um, and Cherie's question was, how brief? Um, that's a great question, Cherie. Um, and unfortunately, there is not a simple answer to that one um, because we do need to consider what is the child's um, developmental age and what are their capacities around that? And also what is the level of trauma that they're experiencing as well? Um, but you can usually get a good sense of um, when you're with a child, if you start noticing what their reactions are. So for some children who've had a lot of um, trauma at the hands of other people, they're not going to feel safe interacting with you for very long. Um, so you might need to do really short, even 30 second interactions with them, um, but doing them regularly. Um, so that way the child can kind of, you know, connect with you briefly in a safe way and then sort of move back to their safe zone as well. Um, and I think an important concept is to remember that the work that we're doing with children who've experienced trauma isn't about us fixing or undoing the trauma that's happened to them. It's about us trying to help them create healthier neural pathways in their brain around positive experiences, um, which then also lets them catch up on some of the developmental tasks that they might have missed out on. So by making sure we're doing regular and repetitive interactions that are really safe and consistent, we're actually helping them to start to build memories of people about them being safe. Um, so you'll sort of get a feel for it working with a child as to how long and what type of activities might be safe for them. Um, but in order for the neural change to happen, it doesn't need to be long. It just needs to be, you know, even a couple of seconds regularly um, is actually enough. Um, so this concept of 60, um, sorry, 60 minutes once a week of therapy 
isn't very applicable to these children that we're working with. Um, and it does need to be really consistent. Um, and Nadine will actually talk a little bit about that in her presentation around how she was able to provide consistency and predictability with the young person that she was working with. Thank you, Holly. Uh, all right, let's take let's take a break. So we've we're just going to have a quick five minute bio break, um, and we will see you back. So we'll see you back at you know it's ten twenty six by my computer clock. So we'll see you back at about ten thirty one. Can you co-host me, Jessamy, or somebody? All right, now I have noticed that we've got a few more questions coming in the chat thread. So we will keep track of those and we will try to respond to them. They're really, um, really excellent questions. Um, so we'll do our best. Um, some of them are, you know, maybe not so much about engagement, but we, you know, if we can't respond to them today, um, we will have further clinical conversations where we will be covering topics like this in a bit more, does you, the sorts of questions you're asking, asking, we'll be covering those in a bit more depth, but we will try to get to some of those questions at the end of the session today. Okay, so, Coming back now, we've got uh, a presentation about some work with a child. Um, and the, the presentation is from Kate Ward. And Kate is our clinical team leader of the Grampians team based in Ballarat. And Kate's a psychologist. And the presenting clinician is Nadine Shearer. And um, Nadine's an art and play therapist. Uh, and she's also based in the Grampians team. And Kate is Nadine's team leader, obviously. So thank you, Kate and Nadine. Thank you, Claire. Um, Nadine, would you like to start by telling us a little bit about Leah, who we'll be talking about today? No worries. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming along. So firstly, I just want to uh, let everybody know that Leah is a pseudonym. Um, and I just want to acknowledge her tenacity before I start talking about her for half an hour. Um, as previously mentioned, we do have consent to talk about her today from her family. So she's a 12-year-old girl living in regional Victoria. She's an Aboriginal child. So in preparation also for today's um, presentation, I had a chat with our Aboriginal team. Take Two is lucky enough to have a cultural um, team and we consult with them anytime we're working with Aboriginal children. So we consult with them during assessment, review and when we're due to close a case. So we're really lucky to have access to this vibrant team. Yes, we sure are. So um, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what brought Leah to the attention of those around her and what meant that she was referred to take to? Sure. So she was referred in August of last year and she was referred by her child protection case manager in the context of concerns around poor emotional regulation. She has a diagnosis of ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, so this diagnosis was made in early primary school. So she really struggles to get anything done uh, from start to finish without somebody looking over her shoulder. She's also struggled with her peer relationship. So Leah can be overbearing, controlling, needy, and this drives people away from her. So she really struggles with her relationships. So these are the externalising behaviours that um, tend to get kids in the door of services like ours and let the people around them know that they need an ex some extra support. So when the referral was made last year, um, I was sort of in anticipation of her heading off to high school at the start of this year. So there was a lot of anxiety about that. Um, her care team, so the group of people around her, teachers, child protection practitioners, her caregivers, all the people helping her is what we talk about as a care team. There was a lot of anxiety about how that transition would go. So I see this little poppet 
um, once a month in person because of where she lives out in the middle of whoop whoop. And I connect three other times during the month via Zoom. So as Jessamy mentioned earlier, um, us Victorians have languished for the past two years through COVID lockdowns and we've been forced online to deliver services. So it's been tricky, um, but we've had our P plates on as Zoom therapists and we've adapted, but it's been hard, I think. Yes, it sure has. And I think um, you've done a great job with what you've done over Zoom. So do you want to talk a little bit about what's happened to Leah, a little bit about her history? Sure. So um, Leah's mother and father have themselves had a tricky earlier lives and they haven't had appropriate supports to manage these challenges. So they've been ongoing. Um, Leah's mother is Aboriginal and so she carries with her the impacts of intergenerational trauma, which is endemic um, following the dislocation from culture and country that's taken place during and post colonisation. So Leah was exposed to adverse experiences in utero. So what I mean by this is she was expo exposed to neglect in the form of being left alone as a baby. Um, her home environment wasn't great. Exposed to trauma in the form of quite significant family violence. Both parents self-medicated with drugs. And um, her mum continues to have some untreated mental health challenges. So a really tricky start. So ultimately, Leah wasn't cared for in the way that we would hope a young child and a baby would be cared for. So eventually she was placed with family um, and various foster placements. So she's had over 10 placements in the first five years of her life. Some of these placements, there was an opportunity to say goodbye and others were really sudden ending. So no opportunity to say goodbye. In some of these placements, her care was chaotic. In one of these placements, her care was abusive. Um. Thanks for that, Nadine. You've told us a little bit about her parents. Do you want to tell the group a little bit about Leah's brother? Sure. So Leah's got a little brother. He is an absolute dynamite, just like her. Um, he's just a few years younger than her. So what we know about Leah's early upbringing, we can also ascribe to him. So really tricky start. Sometimes these, place, these kids were placed together in their placements and sometimes they were placed separately. Leah often had to keep an eye out for her brother, so to be the parent and take care of him, um, which sets up a tricky dynamic um, as they get older. But they, there was a sense of having to stick together. Um, but these kids didn't have many positive role models about how to be in relationship with each other. So they often fought a lot. And this meant it was quite difficult for the foster care system to find them placements with caregivers who could manage um, the level of their complexity. Um, so sometimes this meant that Leah was placed separately. And when we think about both Leah and her brother, we need to hold in mind that because of the earlier care that Leah missed out on, uh, her brain was really focused on keeping safe when she was younger. Um, so she presents as a child of about six or seven emotionally and behaviourally sometimes rather than a 12-year-old. So you can imagine how tricky that would be to make sense of for foster carers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and speaking of carers, do you want to talk a little bit about what role carers or parents play in engagement and why we would think about involving Leah's caregiver in particular in the work we're doing? So when we're thinking about working with kids and young people, we need to view them in the context of their family and important relationships. For change to be effective for a child, a caregiver needs to be on board and working alongside us and working alongside the child, 
making changes themselves, reflecting on their role, and just trying to little by little understand the child's world. So it's like a dance between the caregiver and the child as each of them change. Um, so in an Aboriginal child's life, there can be a lot of people. So Leah has a strong and proud circle of Aboriginal female role models around her, which is amazing. So they provide her with plenty of opportunities to connect to culture when she's ready. So for Leah, that the, her um, main connection is her nan. Um, so she's been the most important person to date. Leah's lived with her consistently for a couple of years now and also briefly when she was younger. So Leah was previously known to take two. Um, so I have inherited some positive regard from Nan around because um, she was, uh, Leah was living with Nan last time Leah was engaged with our service and Nan had a good experience back then. So I've inherited some of that, but I am really mindful of not taking that for granted. And I've really wanted to form my own relationship with Nan from the get go. She's such a strong advocate for her daughter, her granddaughter. Um, so I'm, I was really keen when I first met Nan to set up really clear lines of communication and collaboration when working with her so that I didn't have any form of power over her. Amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about what role Nan's actually played in the work that you're doing with Leah? So a caregiver is my first point of, point of call when I pick up a referral. So uh, Nan was orientated to take to service and assessment. So I call her and tell her who we are and what we do. And I let her know how many sessions we have. Um, and what information I'm going to be seeking and why. I let them know why I'm asking about their own family of origin history, why I'm asking about a developmental history, that I'm not just being plain nosy, that I, it helps us understand as clinicians the child in the context of this history. Um, so I coached Nan about how to explain coming along for the first session to Leah you'd be surprised how often I meet a child for the first time and ask them, why do you think you're here? And they say, oh, I'm going to get Maccas afterwards. I don't know why I'm here. So I coach Nan about how to explain therapy. Um, and for the first session, when I saw, I saw Nan first for a parent session and then Leah immediately after, and Nan was present for that session. Um, and any session, Leah has the option to have Nan on board during that session. It's up to her. So in the consequent work, I contact Nan via phone really regularly. I have Zoom caregiver sessions with her every other week. I maintain Leah's right to confidentiality um, in all of these discussions. I talk in general themes unless there's issues of safety that need to be addressed. So in these sessions, I talk with Nan about how she can understand things like brain development and that bottom-up triangle that's been talked about a lot. And generally how Leah's previous experiences of a trauma and neglect have affected her brain development, but also her perception of the world and relationships and how Leah's nervous system is constantly on high alert because of her early experiences. So together, Nan and I brainstorm things that the family can do together, things that they're already doing, but just tweaking them slightly um, so they can be therapeutic. So thinking about that dosing, the positive brief interactions that Holly spoke to, so an example is instead of watching a movie on your separate devices in your separate bedrooms, let's sit on the couch together and watch something side by side. So this is more relational. Or getting Leah to scoot to the school bus stop rather than 
bundling into the car and driving. So by scooting, her body is regulated. She's a bit more ready to learn when she gets off to school. So Nanny's kept abreast of everybody I've spoken to in the care team, who said what to whom. So I give her a heads up when things, uh, when new things are about to happen in therapy, if I'm going to try something new, so she can help prep Leah. Basically, Nan knows Leah best. So I take her opinion very, very seriously. That's good. So you mentioned before um, there's a care team around Leah and there usually is with the children that take two work with. Do you want to have a bit of a chat about the care team and who you work with in addition to Leah and Nan? So Leah's um, case managed by the local Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Org um, or ACHO as we call them. So they provide case management to Leah. Um, they're in the house, they drop Leah here and there, they work closely with Nan. So I work very, very closely with this human who's the case manager. So partly so we don't double up, but also so we can be kept abreast of what's happening, what's working, what's not. Um, on top of this, we have monthly care team meetings. So the school attend, child protection, Nan comes along, um, there's a respite agency. So it's, there's a cast of thousands, but we all need to be on the same page when supporting families and children. Um, so my working relationship with the ACHO really provides um, both Nan and Leah with multiple trusting relationships that they can both draw on. There's things that Leah tells me that she doesn't tell her ACHO case manager and vice versa. Uh, so she uses these relationships in quite different ways, which is, which is great. I also talk to Leah's school um, and I try to get them to understand that she will need different things in the classroom. She's not going to be sitting in a row <laughs> like this image. Um, I'm trying to get them to understand her through a trauma lens um, holding in mind that regulate, relate, reason um, that we've spoken to today, she's going to need, Lee's going to need to have her nervous system regulated throughout the day. She'll need to engage in movement breaks, have fiddle toys, maybe chew on gum, all sorts of things that might not be allowed by other kids in school she will have different needs. So encouraging them to be as flexible and thoughtful and use their often limited resources wisely in supporting this young person. Cause she's a smart cookie. She has a lot of potential. Um, so we want to see her fulfill that. Absolutely. Um, earlier, Jessamy and Holly both spoke about the importance of trust and safety in relationships with um, the traumatised children that we work with. Can you tell the group a little bit how you establish trust and safety in your relationship with Leah? So I try to ensure predictability. Cookie's just moving. Um, <laughs> through re really regular um, structured sessions. So it's the same bat time, the same bat channel each week. Um, I use the same room when I see her in person and I set it up the same way each time. When I see her via Zoom, I always connect um, from home now, even though we're in the office again. And the reason I make that choice is because of my cats, which I'll speak to in a little bit. Um, so I structure the sessions the same. Um, so we begin with a regulating activity. So we're at the bottom of that upside down pyramid. And in person, we do that using a physio ball that I drag up to where I see her or big therabands. So Leah really is an energizer bunny. She is a nonstop mover. Um, so we do lots of big body movements to calm her nervous system. And then when we're online, 
we do, we're less, um, less physical, but we copy each other. So I'll get her to copy my hands and move around the room. So lots of mirroring activities. And she nearly always has slime with her at her end when we're meeting online. So she'll be using her slime while she's talking to me. So after we've regulated the body quite intent intentionally at the start, then we move to the hard work. Um, so this is when I invite her to talk or draw, um, engage in symbolic play online. I do this through a variety of online tools that are available or using the good old Zoom whiteboard. Um, and so she can engage in those activities if she wishes. But throughout these sessions, she's continuing to regulate her body. She's always on the go. So she'll step into an activity, step away from it to regulate, step in, step out. Um, I also have the same toys available when we meet in person. If there's a new toy that I've introduced, I'll give her a heads up, but I don't do this very often. So I've got sensory items, as I've mentioned. I've got a baby doll, which is important if we think about um, her developmental age and also what has happened to her when she was a baby. So there's lots to work through there. There's Jenga, there's animal figurines, drawing materials, puppets. So always the same things available in person. So when I think about being an online therapist and a therapist in real life, there's some considerations that we need to make around how can I feel comfortable and genuine to share aspects of myself in my relationship? I'm in relationship with this young person. So what am I going to share of myself? So I'm working from home. Um, there's no denying that during the pandemic. So I've been really transparent about that. I've never fuzzed my screen. Um, I'm just here in my office and my cats live with me. So they will make guest appearances. Cookie's tail is often circling around my neck or there'll be rumble time in the background. So Cookie is um, the one lounging in her uh, little pod at the, in that bottom picture and CJ's the fluffy one in the basket. So these little mites um, came to me at the start of the pandemic and they themselves had a trauma history from before they came to me. So I often use their experience of trauma um, to talk about Leah's experiences of trauma because it's a bit easier for Leah to talk about how Cookie gets annoyed and bites me instead of Leah talking about I got angry at school and slapped the kid. It's a little bit safer with that distance to talk about these things. So my cats have become quite a consistent narrative or touch point or anchor for Courtney, uh, for Leah in sessions. So hopefully in these sessions, enjoyment is experienced through um, Leah having choices. Um, I'm quite child led, even though I have my agenda and my goals that I'd like to move through, I need to be really flexible with this. I encourage Leah to have a lot of control in sessions um, and we can do this in a variety of ways by changing activities. She can hang up or leave sessions when she chooses online and in person. She can choose how to who's in the session and um, what conversations to dip in and out of basically. Lovely. Um, Holly mentioned earlier the importance of cultural safety in sessions, um, and we know that Leah is a young Aboriginal woman. Can you talk a little bit about how you've made sessions culturally responsive? Sure. So luckily for us, um, the centre that I see her in in person is a, it's a really gorgeous centre. 
and it's got an Aboriginal sculpture on the outside. So Leah will often walk through that sculpture as she comes to the front door. Um, there's Aboriginal flags and only Aboriginal artwork on the walls. So cultural safety is signalled in that environment quite strongly. So when I first met Leah during um, my assessment, I used the cultural engagement tool, um, which is in the bottom, um, part of which is in the bottom right-hand corner of this clip. So the, that's the kinship circle. Um, so I used this circle to invite her to map who was important to her in her world. So she popped herself in the middle and then popped her important relationships around her. Um, this is really easy to use online and in person with, with Aboriginal families. Um, so this gave me a sense of who's important to her. I always try and keep a cultural lens around activities. I'm, I've been curious around Leah's totem she has an emerging connection to her Aboriginality, um, which is sort of in keeping with um, the experiences of the other adults in, in her family who kind of came to their Aboriginality in their teens. So I'm aware of the, all the family's totems and I make sure I have these animal figurines or as close to those totems in my animal collection as when I meet her in person. And um, my dolls and my human figurines have a variety of skin colours available. So during activities, such as movement activities, I might reference um, Australian landscapes or gum trees. We might sway like gum trees or uh, walk around the room like brolgers. So just little things kind of scattered in amongst our activities. But I think <laughs> the biggest thing I notice is during Zoom sessions, um, family is present. So I need to be flexible around this. And this is her family, her kin. Um, sometimes they're part of the session and sometimes not. Another thing I do is I check with Nan about cultural norms, particularly as Leah moves towards within adolescence. I've needed to check with Nan about the appropriateness of talking about certain topics and women's business and all that sort of stuff. So I've checked in with Nan about that. Lovely. At the start of your presentation, you talked about some of the behaviours that other people were seeing that were concerning. Can you tell the group a little bit about how we view these behaviours as symptoms? Yeah, so with all we know about Leah's early life, there are a number of things that are really tricky for her so she has a variety of assumptions about how the world works because of her early experiences so one of these is that her sense of self is really very negative and so what this looks like in the therapy room is that she doesn't bother she makes a mess she's quite grotty never really washes her hands properly. They're always covered in freshly made slime because she's always making slime each day. Um, she finds it really tricky to reflect on her behaviours outside of session because uh, she's been given the message right through her life that she is the problem. So my job as a therapist in sessions, I can notice her success. I can notice her efforts. I can maintain positive regard for her. So that can be tricky at times, but part of the way I do this is I set boundaries in our relationship so that I don't get annoyed with her. So I let her draw on my arms, but not my face. Um, so therefore I don't need to be annoyed with her if she tries to draw my face. So I also provide her with opportunities for mastery so she does this through teaching me origami, which she's quite good at. Um, she's also quite good at drawing cartoons. So she shows me in these moments that she's quite capable and that she can be proud of herself momentarily when she does this. So another 
Um, another symptom for her is that her relationships have been ruptured and often not repaired. So relationships haven't been safe. So it's so tricky for her to be in relationships and trust that others will be there for her. So this translates in the room to her testing our relationship constantly. She sometimes um, attacks me verbally, and this could be directly like, you're, st you're stupid, you don't know anything. And she leans right into the camera and says, you're stupid, <laughs> you're ugly. Or she indirectly attacks me um, through verbal attacks, attacks on the cats because she knows that I care about my cats. So in a plain narrative, she once informed me that Cookie had bitten me quite badly, apparently, and I needed to get Cookie put down. And this was absolutely what it need, needed to happen. Another time she made up a really detailed story about CJ getting squashed on the road out the front and it was a very gory story. So I see these statements as sort of a testing of our relationship, sometimes a rejection depending on the, the context, but also She's also perhaps in a way letting me know that, you know, I've experienced loss of a loved one and I've been hurt by people that I care about. So having a think about what these things mean. So how I respond to this presentation in, in therapy is that I acknowledge her feelings and my own. I'd be really scared. It's sad if I had to put Cookie down. Um, she needs to know that her feelings won't destroy me, that I am safe enough to hold these big feelings for her and to signal to her that it's okay to be angry, scared, hurt, whatever. Um, it's not necessarily okay to act in certain ways when you feel these feelings, but the feelings are okay and I can help her hold them. So I keep turning up for Zoom sessions. I check in, I touch base. So the Zoom sessions can be seen as those briefer, pleasurable moments compared with an in-person session. So she utilises them as she wishes. Sometimes they're five minutes, sometimes they're 45 minutes, depending on what her needs are on the day. So I follow her lead. So she's got some agency about what she explores in each session. And if I muck up, which I often do, get the name of a friend wrong or something I take responsibility for this and apologize so lastly um, her world has been so uncertain and unsafe at times so this translates to her being restless struggling to stay focused hyper vigilant of what's going on where's Nan where are the cats who's in the foyer so I can be consistent and congruent with my emotions with her in sessions and playful and accepting and curious. Lovely work. And I'd imagine, and I know there's been lots of challenges for Leah and with Leah. Um, do you want to talk to the group a little bit about some of the challenges for you working with Leah? We might run out of time because um, there's so many. There is. So every session is a challenge. I have to pedal really hard. Uh, I often feel nervous before sessions. There's nothing like a teenager telling you in the most colourful language where to go. So I often question, am I ugly? Am I stupid? I'm a terrible therapist. She's right. I'm terrible at my job. I'm telling you, Kate, on Monday I'm quitting. I'm going to be a gardener. That doesn't involve people. So um, I think part of my anxiety prior to Zoom sessions is that I feel I can't rely on my tried and tested in-person holding methods for managing sessions. Um, but this isn't entirely true. But we need to remember that I'm still a P-plate Zoom therapist. Um, 
So when we think about Leah and what she's been through, one of the results is that relationships are hard for her. So kids often make us feel like they feel. I feel anxious. I'm sure she feels anxious. They treat us like they've been treated. They show us. So Leah shows me this every session and it's really tricky. So she's delightful and funny and fun, but it's hard work. So in working with her, I have to park my agenda. I have to go with her flow and be child-led. And this happens a lot more in online sessions than in-person sessions. And it's very chaotic, but it's my job to hold that consistent space for her in the ways that I've spoken to previously. Um, but this chaos is really a reflection of her internal and exter- external word. She's showing me this, but I find the chaos hard because, as you know, Kate, I'm a fairly ordered soul, um, so I have to manage my anxiety around that chaos. Yeah, absolutely. Part, yeah, so part of the way things are chaotic is um, – Sometimes it's the whole family in the kitchen. Like last week I was sat up on the kitchen bench while she cooked pancakes and that was our session. She didn't want to hang up on me, but she didn't want to talk to me. So that's an example of um, me just rolling with it. Sometimes she has me in the bedroom and this lets me know she's more open and talking a bit deeper. Yeah. Have things gone wrong? In sessions with Leah? All the time. So she hangs up on me. I get fired. Two weeks ago, there was all sorts of expletives. I don't need to see you anymore. I don't even need therapy. This is stupid. You're stupid. But at the time, I was moving to a new phase of treatment. So it was different, therefore difficult. And I needed to reestablish a new pattern of predictability. So sometimes she doesn't log on. So I'll reach out and I draw a little picture to let her know I'm thinking of her and I send it to her. There's no consequences for her if she doesn't log on um, or if she, does, if she ends the session early, that's fine. I still turn up the next week. I spend that time talking to Nan instead. So I have a good chin wag to her on the phone. Um, and then we just try again next week. So that engagement's ongoing. Every session engagement begins again with kids like Leah. So it's my job to engage her and the family. So when things go wrong, it's okay. We can continue our relationship. Um, We take, I try and take responsibility if I make a misstep, if I get things wrong, I get things wrong all the time. So you don't know anything, Nadine this is bullshit and when she says that to me my response is oh wow gosh I got that wrong let me try again Um, so I keep on acknowledging when I've missed the mark so sometimes if things aren't on track Nan is enlisted or she self enlists in the background and she is curious and she might name feelings for Leah or Nan and I have a chat together so that Leah can is in earshot of what we're talking about and we're curious and wondering. And this brings Leah back to the table. And this lets me know that there's an ever-increasing connection and that Nan's perception and understanding of Leah through a trauma lens is really growing. So that's really lovely to see. So I think with kids like Leah... um, the marker for success will be when this cycle's reduced and this sense that each of us is peddling less in our relationship. And I know as your team leader that you have had some successes with Leah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of those major successes? So I think she's just more vulnerable with me so she talks with me about her worries and her successes and even some of her poor choices which is a big deal for her she um, in a recent session she announced that uh, I'm going to be the therapist today and 
So she sat me up on the chair and she took notes about stuff I said, which is weird because I never take notes with kids. Um, and this allowed for longer play sequences and some really important themes about how many professionals had been in her life and the lack of nurture she had received. So at one point in this session, she morphed into a doctor and declared that I'd been injured by Cookie, of course, and she wrapped my arm in a bandage. And then she reversed the play and let me wrap her imaginary wounds. So this is really quite significant for a kid like Leah to allow nurturing in the room in the session. And this play has been repeated since. So finally, I think the biggest success is that she keeps coming back. You know, she keeps logging on and practicing being in relationship with me. She's slowly learning to trust me and the important people around her are increasingly empathetic of her experiences and they're responding to her in more helpful ways. So hopefully, you know, life just feels a little bit easier across the board for her. Lovely. Nadine, what advice would you give to professionals working with children like Leah? Oh, I think two points. So we, we hear so often, um, Kate and I hear it nonstop, phrases from other services like, oh, they disengaged or they wouldn't engage. And services close. The referral gets closed. But for children like Leah, who's a really good representation of the kinds of kids we get referred to take to, the bulk of the work is engagement, which is practising being in relationship. So we need to hold in mind that engagement is a verb and try and keep it as active as possible each session, each week and multiple times each session as well and meeting that child where they're at. And I think the second point is that it's not about you. You know, I'm ugly, I'm silly, I'm stupid. It's not about me. Children may reject or challenge in a variety of ways and it's professionals working with vulnerable kids we really need not to take this personally um, I need to be aware of what that brings up for me and deal with that outside of the therapy session by talking to you Kate or external supervision or therapy um, but it's it's not about me it's about the kids and their experiences and it's my job to support them through those feelings Lovely. Nadine, I want to say a big, big thank you to you for this presentation. Um, we love talking about the children that we work with in the team. Um, and I hope that everyone's really enjoyed hearing about the work that you're doing with Leah. Um, and we'll hand back to Claire now to finish up. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and also thank you, Nadine. That was wonderful. We've had lots and lots and lots of comments as you've been talking and we've had quite a few questions. Um, so I might just um, I might just put some of those questions to you. Um, Duke asked a question which I thought was a really good one actually, not that there's any bad questions. How do you respond when Leah calls you ugly? Um, it happens so often. <laughs> Um, I think some, I try different things. So sometimes she might call me ugly because she's um, wanting to push back about something or she's annoyed with me. And so I might try that and say, oh, I wonder if you're annoyed with me um, or I wonder if you don't want to do what I'm asking or really, I wonder if somebody's called you ugly before. Mm. Um, so with those sort of personal attacks, often it's um, some of our kids have experienced that by those around them. Mm. Yeah, because I feel like a, a lot of the time an, an adult's instinctive response if a kid insults us like that is to say, oh, that's not a very nice thing to that's say. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, people are loving what you've got to say, Nadine, I have to tell you. Um, Mel asked, um, and I'm not sure how much you want to respond to this, but what, what are Leah's goals, given that we sort of have talked in the sessions about the importance of focusing on goals? 
Um, well, I mentioned in um, in brief that she had quite a negative sense of, of self. And I think that we see that play out in a range of ways by attacking other people. And um, so I think her interpersonal relationships and, and being able to feel more trusting in them, um, that is, of course, a lifelong goal for yeah. kids like Leah. Um, she has a range of post-traumatic symptoms as well, which I'm hoping to address. Um, so she's feel, my hope is that she will be able to feel her nervous system will be a little less on alert in relationships and at night and at school and in public places. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Megan asked a question which I think everyone probably said yes how do you handle that and her question was how do you handle the ending so not just with Leah but how do you how do we as take to handle ending the work with clients like these oh it's really tricky <laughs> and maybe Kate can speak to this as well because sometimes we don't get an opportunity to say goodbye kids mm. might move out of region or child protection might um, close their engagement so we don't have as long to say goodbye or families disengage um, they they've got other priorities they might be have illness or something happens or somebody loses their job so sometimes we don't get an opportunity to say goodbye and I think in these instances what I found helpful is to do my own process of goodbye and that's for me and I might do a sand tray or draw a picture um, for myself and have the goodbye that I would hope. And obviously this is an imaginary goodbye. Um, but with kids, when we meet them, we need to always be talking about from the get-go when we say goodbye. So I let Leah and Nan know that, um, you know, I wouldn't be around forever that we would try and work together and it might take six months, it might take a year, but I would say goodbye. Um, and when we're thinking about saying goodbye to kids, there's often, if it's a planned goodbye, um, there's often a regression leading up to an ending. So we'll see kids showing a lot of mastery and they might be less engaged in our relationship and it's like oh, I don't want to see you I've got soccer training um, or I've got a birthday party which is a very different um, excuse for not to come along to therapy rather than you're ugly you're stupid this is stupid I'm not doing it it's a very different feeling the ending of therapy when kids are feeling more masterful uh -huh. um, it's like the therapeutic space loses its magic uh -huh. um, and um, but there'll often be a regression towards the end. So that's difficult to see, um, but it is part of the process. Um, we write letters, we have parties. Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard. Mm. It's hard for us, it's hard for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's always a point at which we have to think is this good enough we can't solve all these problems but is it good enough for now that's right that's that's what I was going to add Nadine is particularly with with you know the the cohort of children that we work with in take two and lots of people who have joined with us today work with that we're not going to kind of we're not going to resolve everything or fix everything that that the aim of our work and then the point where we sort of have to draw the line in a sense is around yeah is this kid safe enough and often it's primarily about do do they have invested adults in their life who can scaffold what will be ongoing adversity for these kids often um, but do they have we done the work with what we call the therapeutic web around the child so that they can provide the child some level of safety and connection when the when the going gets tough um yeah that's that's often a measure of success mm. for us yeah. really yeah yep um 
Claire, which is an excellent name. Claire has just posted a question in the chat. Um, yeah, how do you build the capacity of parents and carers to build more therapeutic relationships with children, given that they are the ones who are with them 24 seven and your therapeutic relationship is always destined to be short term? That's a whole session, Claire. I don't know mm. if we can answer that in two minutes. Um, I don't know, does anyone wanna, wanna respond to that? I think a lot of what Nadine's talked about with the work that she's doing with Nan is a really good example of how we're building the capacity of Leah's care in particular, um, meaning that when we do close, Nan will be able to hold that space for Leah that Nadine's doing. Um, but Claire's right, that is probably a whole session on the parent carer work that we do in Take Two. Yeah, yeah, and we and that is absolutely, a, it's a core um, principle that underpins our work that we we just about never just do individual work with the child that these kids often they are they are they're you know Leah is you know Leah's got a lovely stable caring nurturing home um lots of the kids that we work with don't um you know their placements are unstable you know their caregivers find their behaviors so challenging to respond to day in day out that the carers get exhausted and the placements often break down um, and our task is, you know, often it's a beginning task before we do anything directly with the child is to engage with the carers, engage with the teachers, engage with the care team around the child and try to build a shared understanding across those people of, you know, who this child is, how they've come to where they are now and how to start to make sense of their behaviours through, you know, through the trauma lens, through the developmental disorders lens sometimes, through whatever lenses we need to um, look through, but trying to get a shared understanding, that's, that's a large part of the work we do. So we do lots of psychoeducation, um, lots and lots of going to meetings, lots and lots of work with carers. Um, sometimes carers and kids together but yeah it's it's very much a systemic approach yeah um, I'm just having a quick look at the chat thread um, okay yeah, and Jessamy has just commented, which hopefully people will see, that we, we run a range of other workshops and particularly the workshop that we deliver called It Takes a Village, which is a workshop for professionals which focuses on, on the sort of challenges of working within care teams and within systems that are really complex and systems that work with people with all sorts of complex needs. Um, that's a really nice workshop to help people sit back and think about what are some of the dynamics that come into play and how can I, as an individual professional, um, be aware of those dynamics and how can I avoid contributing too much to those dysfunctional dynamics? <clears throat> um, and Wendy, your question in terms of workshops for schools supporting students with trauma, um, I would recommend as a starting point that you go to the Berry Street website and look up the Berry Street education model. Berry Street has a whole, it's called BSEM, B-S-E-M. Um, and if you just Google the Berry Street education model, um, they, have a, they have fantastic training for schools around basically providing a whole of school trauma-informed approach um, rather than just, you know, training specific to a particular child or a particular behaviour. Um, all right, look, we've only got five minutes to go. So I just, I would like to, um, again, thank Nadine and Kate and also thank Jessamy and Holly. Um, uh, and I'll just draw your attention to the Engaging Children Practice Guide that we've referred to. And inside that practice guide, there is an engagement planning tool. So we really encourage you to, to look at that tool and consider in your work engaging with these vulnerable kids, paying attention to what happened to the child in the past. So understanding a bit about their story, that's really helpful. Thinking about what past experiences might mean for the child in the present, what templates have they carried through with them into the present. And Plan how you can respond by using flexible approaches that are focused in the beginning in particular, but ongoingly on building trust and safety. Um, okay, and if anyone has any 
uh, sort of further interest in further practice development, please go to the Berry Street Professional Learning website. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to Take Two's Relate newsletter. And there's a tab, if you go to the Take Two website, there's a tab where you can click on that and subscribe to the newsletter. So the, the recording from this session will be promoted through the newsletter. Um, and the newsletter is a great way to sort of keep up to date with other professional development activities that Take Two is delivering, but also other information about working with trauma-informed children. Uh, thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you at the next Clinical Conversations and go forth and enjoy working with these really vulnerable kids and you know, kids with highly complex needs um, and doing the, continue doing the good work that you all do. Thanks, everyone.